Hello and welcome everybody at Male at the IAA Mobility 2021 here at the Open Space in Munich at the Königsplatz. My name is Lisa Hofmann and I'm the host for our Male Mobility Talks and we are going to have another one today. And our topic is future mobility and technology and how customers and enterprises benefit from know-how and Pioneer Geist. Therefore, I'm going to have two experts by my side and I want to introduce them to, the, to you. And let's start with the lady. Her name is Jumana Alcibay and she's the member of the management board Male and the chairwoman of the <laughs> management board Male Bea. Jumana, nice to have you here. How are you doing? Very well, thank you very much. And my second expert is Dr. Roger Bush. He's the Vice President Engineering in Thermal Management. Roger, how much do you like that booth here at the Königsplatz? I like it actually, and it's it's um, unusual. It's the first time for me that I'm on a booth on a ferry outside. Even if we are in thermal management systems, I would expect it, or I would love to have it a little bit more chilly because it's pretty warm here outside. But I'm happy to be here today. Yeah, it's really hot here in Munich, but it's totally different with the booth outside. But everybody likes it, I think. So let's just talk with our talk, Jumana. At Mala, you are the woman for the right climate. Maybe Maybe also because of your character, I don't know. But your business unit develops and produces everything that supplies batteries, powertrains, passenger interiors with the pleasant temperatures. So why is thermal management that important? Well, I mean, first thing is if you're driving in a vehicle and uh, the temperature is like today, you would like to have a perfect climate inside the car. You don't want to have too much heat or you don't want to freeze. So that's actually the first important thing which everybody feels. And the second thing is that, um, well, we're thinking about electrical vehicles and uh, mileage and long distance is getting more important. Energy efficiency is more important. So uh, we are combining our know-how with the classical cooling system, with the air conditioning system to enable um, those uh, battery electric vehicles for the future. Maybe we can do it again because I guess we had no sound. So can you just sum it up? <laughs> Why is thermal management that important? <laughs> First thing is in the vehicle you want to have the right temperature. When you're driving you want to have it comfortable, it's well-being. And the second thing is for battery electric vehicles, mileage as well as energy efficiency is getting more important. So we are combining our products, for example, cooling systems as well as air conditioning system into a perfect system for electric vehicles. Yeah, maybe you can just uh, talk a little bit more about that product. What kind of products do you do you offer? Well, it's, it's a whole range. Like I said, we're doing air conditioning units. We are doing engine cooling modules and components. We've got heaters and e-heaters. We've got heat pumps and e-compressors. And last but not least, we also started doing battery cooling and heating. So pretty bright, uh, pretty uh, wide spectrum. Absolutely. So Roger, let's just bring that topic to the everyday life. Why should people who drive a car be familiar with terms like thermal management? Um, I don't know if they really have to be familiar with the terminology thermal management system, but I think everybody who is driving a car is basically using the thermal management system in the car. So if you switch on the heater, if you switch on the ventilation, if you switch on your air conditioning system, all of that is the thermal management system, which you directly can feel in the compartment. But there's much beyond when we're then talking about cooling, cooling efficiency for the overall powertrain or in the future for the electric powertrain. Uh, and all of that, the combination with the cooling systems and the uh, air conditioning system, this is basically what we call thermal management systems. Mm -hmm. So it sounds so physically, but actually everybody is used to thermal management in daily life, right? Right. It's, it's similar like physics. I think if you ask some folks about, do you like physics, everybody is telling you, no, um, maybe it was not my most beloved yeah, uh, lessons <laughs> in school. But basically, if you don't understand la la physics, you could not survive. So basically, I think everybody has it somehow. Yeah. So it's natural. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, Jumana, now as a driver of a car, I am familiar with thermal management, like Roger explained. But now I wonder um, if there's a difference whether thermal management components come from Male or other suppliers. 
<laughs> yeah, actually, I wouldn't work for Mali if uh, it didn't make a difference. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are experts on component level and we are using that expertise to develop in or develop systems. And um, with the know-how and the worldwide team we have, we can tune the components to make them also future-proof and also design customer-oriented or customer-specific systems which allow energy efficiency mileage, like I said at the beginning. So it's, it's really something where, where we've got a long heritage. So what kind of systems are we talking about? Could you sum it up? I mean, one thing is the, the, um, the cooling system. So if you want to cool a powertrain or if you want to cool a battery electric vehicle, um, it, has, it has everything or this system needs to be laid out to have everything inside and to allow best of energy efficiency. And then in the future, we are also combining that now, um, including the battery as a heat source or, for example, the um, power electronics or the e-machines. So it's getting more complex because it's not like it used to be with just one um, combustion engine. It's just it is much more flexible. But originally, the term thermal management comes from the world of combustion engine powertrains, but it's also like plays a significant role for electric yeah. cars, right? Correct. Absolutely. So does the changed installation situation also change anything technically? Or maybe you can explain what kind mm. of changed installation situation are we talking about? Uh, I would not say directly it's a changed installation situation. First of all, we do have more or less the same products. We have to modify them a little bit to make them fit for those new requirements. That's one thing. And the second thing is if you want to, for example, cool a battery in a day like that and you are um, running full speed on a highway, you have to ensure that your system is able to have or to fulfill these high requirements, so to cool the battery, that it's still functioning in a perfect and optimized mode. At the same time, the driver still wants to be comfortable in the car and wants to have cool air and not be sitting there in full heat. So it's, it's more complex because the components which have to be cooled are different, but the ultimate goal is still the same. We want to be comfortable in a car with a high efficiency and driving safely. So, but to what extent are the components for internal combustion vehicles different from those for electric cars? Uh, we use some of the components like we used them before. It's just a question of how you sort them in the system. And the second thing is there are more components which you have to include, like a battery cooling plate, for example, or we're going towards e-compressors, but perhaps Roger can elaborate a bit more on that. <laughs> yeah, what's, okay. what's your opinion on that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I, I think basically um, it is all about heat exchange. Heat exchange in a way you can cool or you can heat it up. And basically what Shaumana just mentioned when you asked the question, how is it changing? In the, in the past you had an internal combustion engine. An internal combustion engine always have a belt drive in the front, which you are normally using for driving the generators or for driving compressors for climate, for, for, for AC systems or for air conditioning systems. So you need a compressor inside. If you're talking about a fully battery electric vehicle, you don't have any more belt drive. So this means you totally have to change the way how such a compressor looks like because now you basically have to have a own electric drive in the compressor because the drivetrain from, from an internal combustion engine is missing. So and this is what your managers mentioned. I think there's always some kind of tweaking around. Sounds easy. Sometimes it's quite complicated <laughs> to go from, from a mechanical to just uh, electrified uh, vehicle. But at the end of the day, it's all about really getting the combination and getting the best out of it. Getting the best out of cooling plus uh, heating and the combination of that. And I think this is what we're trying to do more and more in the future, so that we are really using the electric powertrain the, and harvest basically the heat from the electric powertrain to heat up also the cabin and take even the outside temperature. You said it sounds simple, but is it simple or is it more complex? Um, it, it depends how you look on it. I, for me, I think it, it has a certain beauty. It is different, I think, than in the past where we were talking about heat exchangers, we were talking about radiators, we were talking about evaporators. 
So basically always some kind of heat exchanger. We were talking about valves, we were talking about fan drives for cooling modules, stuff like that. So it was more on a component level. And what we are entering more and more, because it is really about how can you generate the most energy efficient system. And that's always more than just the pieces of component. It's about the overall system and how such an overall system topology in combination of the EE powertrain plus the cooling and the HVAC system looks like. AC system, so we, sorry, we, we most of the time, that's another term like <laughs> thermal management. If you say HVAC, that means heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And if you're in this business, that's uh, an acronym which we should not use here, I think. Yeah, but maybe it's easier <laughs> to use the English words for that, right? Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. the German ones. Right. So, Germana, let's just um, go back to the everyday work. Uh, because um, how does the work in the team look like? Do you have different teams for both types of vehicles, or does one team do it all? No, actually, I mean, like we said, the components are a bit different, but they're more or less the same basis. So I think um, if we would have separate teams for combustion engine um, and for electric vehicles, we would, use, uh, we would lose synergies and we could not exchange enough. So we do not separate these teams. It's more that we are looking more into specific product fields where the teams have the, the biggest overlap and the um, biggest synergies and can learn from each other, but, but also develop and, and innovate together. So no, we don't separate. Um, and honestly, if the world moves towards electrification, um, I think it would also not be nice to have some team working on the old world and the other team on the new world. It's, it's, it's kind of it would be a separation. So no, we don't do that. It's you, one team. You've said the keyword learn from each other. <laughs> so Roger, at what points does the know-how from the traditional automotive world help in mastering the new task related to e-mobility? Like Let's go back to the roots of <laughs> automotive <laughs> roo know-how. <laughs> no, let's go, maybe let's go back to the roots of Mahle. I think Mahle is known in the community everywhere for, for material science. So we were known for, okay, we, we did in the past, and we're still doing, for, for, of course, pistons, we, and we, we did filters. So that was all some, um, some technology which we grew up with. And for sure, we can use, for example, especially in the material science area, a lot of this knowledge when we are talking about heat exchangers and future heat exchangers. And that was the same part, I think, in your question, where we are moving then to in the future. That means that um, we, we will see more and more of this combined system, which I mentioned already before. And uh, for that, I, I think some of the, the the knowledge which we g had from from the past is really essential, because if I would say it this way, if you would never, or if you did never, or you never did before a kind of cooling system for our IC engine, it would not have been that easy for us to enter also in the cooling of battery electric vehicles. So the basic physics of the heat exchanger is the same. The shape looks totally different because the whole compartment looks different and the installation space which is available is different. So I think there are a lot of learning and basically I think also in the uh, battery electric world, I think the, uh, the, the, the logic of an automobile supplier is not changing. Maybe the speed has to be different now yes. because we have a lot of startups uh, who are telling us, okay, I want your product, I'm convinced, send it to us tomorrow. So that's not the normal way what we are normally used to do in the automobile industry because we normally have long uh, lead times, development periods. And that's something which is really changing. And I think this is, I think it's great because it's, it creates a lot of dynamic. And if you have, passionate engineers who really like what they're doing, then I think it's, it's, it's great. It's a great time. But what do you think, what are the specific challenges and maybe how can you solve them with the know-how of the traditional automotive? I think um, what I mentioned before uh, is really about um, to, to really ca go, go a little bit away from a pure component supplier component developer really to, to somebody who can offer the customer system solutions. 
This does not mean that every customer at the end of the day will buy a system, but I think you need to have as a company a deep understanding how such an overall topology lo could look like. And uh, uh, let me give you an example that it's not getting so, so or sounds so, so crazy. For example, when when you uh, when you are trying, if you have a battery electric vehicle, you are going on the autobahn, you are driving from Stuttgart to Munich, from Munich back. So you should have a quite big battery and then you think oh I have to charge my battery and you want to do hypercharging so hypercharging mean you have high uh, high high currents for sure and you, and uh, then you you want to reduce really the time which you knew need to charge a battery but if you put 300 kilowatt on a battery during the charging then if you're not cooling the battery it, it blows the battery away or you have a lot of derating so and that is exactly what we are doing then so we are using basically and this is maybe the beauty you know chilling from your compartment from the AC from the air conditioning so it's cool the, the wind inside is cool and basically we are using the same technology so the same compressor we also have heat exchanger and using this for cooling the battery in the time during you, you're doing, for example, this hypercharging or in, in all the other areas when of the operation of the EE powertrain. Yeah, it would be the worst case if I would destroy that battery, so hopefully <laughs> you it's should not, not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should not. And you've also talked about the deep understanding. Mm -hmm. Do you get it by the cooperation of different Male divisions, maybe? Uh, yes, that, that's also a part of it. Um, so if you if you look what I said before, what we call HVAC, heating, ventilation, air condition, this is, that's a device which is basically, you don't see it in your car, you see maybe the, 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 yeah, the flaps where, where the wind is coming out, but basically everything um, of this system is in the background and this, um, it, it's more, it's more than just heating and ventilation and air conditioning, at the end of the day you also clean the air. So you may know it from your car, you have such a, so you can push a button so that only the, the air inside is moved. Uh, on the other hand side, we are working, so you have filters in these HVAC systems, which we are developing in another division of Male, uh, where we are now on a new development for, for filters which can drastically really reduce the particulate contamination, which is maybe outside, for example, when you're driving into a tunnel. And uh, we are quite proud also on there on a new technology, which is also uh, helping us in this time to bind uh, the, the virus. So, and, and in this kind of combination, you see, this is what I think that's also a strength then of Mahle that we can combine from different divisions technology. That was one example for on the filter side. We do it also for on the electronic side, maybe for pumps, maybe for electric pumps. And so there's, I think, a, a fairly good uh, cooperation and collaboration inside. And I guess everybody wants to have a filter like that right now in the pandemic situation, I right? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, after all, uh, I noticed one advantage of uh, Male is that it has overarching know-how on both sides. So, the combustion engine and the e-car side, right? Both yeah. sides. Both. Yeah. And I, and, and I think it's, it's important. And I think, yes, of course, we... I think we want to shape also a little bit the future mobility with the technologies what we have. And, yeah... This is what we are trying to do, of so, course. Jumana, let's just talk about your job again. As an industrial en engineer, um, you embody both, like the technical and the business management approach, right? But today you're responsible for important divisions within Male and for all of the employees. So I guess the manager is most in demand of your job, right? Yeah. How, <laughs> how much room is left for the engineer part? I, like in a company like Mahle, you cannot separate that manager from engineer or engineering from management. Um, we've got a long heritage, we've got a deep technical know-how, like you said, so it is mixing up in your day-to-day -day life. Um, you need a deep technical understanding of the products, you have to work with the teams um, on innovations, like on systems we discussed before. Um, at the same time, you also have to ensure that um, we earn money with that, well, because that's mainly what, what we are there to do. Um, we have to also develop our people, so it's kind of mixing all the time. And I would not say, well, tomorrow morning I am the engineer and the afternoon I'm going to manage something else. So it's, it's, it's both. But how can we imagine the engineer and manager working together? 
No, take for example, if we're discussing a new product, there is one thing the engineer is discussing with the teams about um, what requirements do we want to fulfill, is there a market for that product, how should that look like also in terms um, what what the rest of the market is doing and we're looking into specifics of uh, how we, we design it. And then the other thing is what is the cost position, where are we going to manufacture that, um, who are the customers, what could be the price point, how are we going to bring that into the market. So it's kind of moving always back and forth from the technical side to the commercial side and marketing side and then you've got the personnel side as well. Because if you decide to, to bring that to, to a new plant, for example, you have to think about stuffing um, the plant and finding the right experts. So it's kind of, and actually I like that because it's not really one topic, it's, it's moving all the time and so that's, that's more or less also the energy which, uh, which flows. Another interesting aspect is um, when we talked in the beginning, I said you are the chair woman because <laughs> the engineering world is predominantly male. Yeah. So how do you experience this as a female executive? Uh, most of the times I don't think about it because, I mean, you said I'm an industrial engineer and, and I did my studies here um, in the southern part of Germany. So that was already the start of where you were one of the, the few ladies. And then with my, with my career through the automotive industry, that never changed. And actually today it's, it's just normal. So I'm happy if there is somebody um, which is uh, with me on, the, on that side. But on the other hand side, it's, it's all about business and working together. And so you forget about it sometimes you then are reminded but typically not so so what do you think what do women different than men <laughs> very difficult question and um, I would say it's not really about women and men it's more about personality and you could find both or in both types different styles of leading um, so there is not that is a typical female behavior and a typical male behavior um, with, with the whole experience I made, it's really, cha um, it's really depending on the person you're sitting in front of. And um, perhaps the only thing where I would say uh, a woman is a bit different is in, in how they communicate and how they exchange and interact a bit. But overall, it's really a personality topic. Roger is making a, an interesting phase. I just need to <laughs> ask him, what's your opinion on that? What's different? Uh, you asked me really on the gender topic? Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, sure, I was not aware. Sure. Okay, <laughs> let me try to give you an answer. Um, it's, I have to say it's different. I know, I know Jumana now quite long and I have to put it on her, no, not on women in general. And we, we started to work as colleagues. I think we become almost friends and now she's my boss. And uh, so it's, it's good, really it's good <laughs> because um, I think there's, there's a lot of trust and uh, she was talking before a little bit about values and how, how she's also guiding her team and it's totally different. On the other hand side, I have to say now, it is really a lot of truth in women can do multitasking and men maybe <laughs> not because that runs me sometimes mad what she's doing in parallel, writing to her daughter, discussing with us, writing emails in parallel. It's amazing. I don't know how she's doing it. And the communication is totally different to what I was used to in former times. So it's much less formal. What also means that I sometimes get WhatsApp at, I don't know, one o'clock in the night could happen. But it's different. It's and it's fun, I have to say. So it's not about gender. It's really about, I think, personality. It's about the people who are doing it. So good to hear that, isn't it? Yeah, it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> and you said um, you've been the only woman when you start uh, studying. Not the only, but, but one few, of a few. Yeah. yeah. What has already changed? Um, I would say the the question of availability of availability of talent has has started to to make a change in thinking and. It's not so common anymore to discuss the topic, is a woman able to discuss technical topics? That is getting less and less. On the other hand side, there is still a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of um, bias in it and there's still a lot of uh, doubt whether it is kind of yeah, equal. Um, so I think we still have a, the way to go, especially we need kind of a critical mass so that, that discussion stops. And 
somehow I would love to, at, at a certain point of time, not to discuss that topic, but to think about more about personality or products, but it's still there. So it, there is a change, it's, it's moving forward, but it's not going to happen in the next five years. Yeah, let's let's see what's going on. We also need uh, to talk about the globalization of Male because you're uh, a businesswoman. How many nights are you sleeping in your own bed in a year? Um, well, actually, I think there is the time before Corona and the time in Corona. Um, before Corona, typically, I, I tried to travel once a month abroad, so kind of Japan, China, North America. So sleeping at home would be like 14, 15, 16 days and the rest would be wow. in the hotel. Um, with Corona that changed and I do believe that change will stay. So it's not going to be like this again. And, and it's also okay, I think, because we have different styles of communicating. We have uh, different possibilities to work with international teams also on a digital basis. So that whole crazy traveling um, we used to do before the pandemic is going to reduce and not coming back and that that is in our new world an asset i would say but uh, concerning your work what role do experiences abroad or international exchange play in your daily working life it's absolutely crucial because you said we're an um, um, international company we've got teams all over the world um, not only to serve the local customers, but also we have um, development teams, there, plants there. So it's really an international setup. And I would say um, in a normal working day, there is, is very scarce a meeting where we just have German participation or European participation. There's always someone from abroad. Um, and so it's really crucial to understand how do you communicate with different cultures? How do you incorporate them? Because as a German company, you also tend to think from Germany for the rest of the world, which is really difficult. So um, it is really crucial to understand that different regions require different approaches, different products, but also different communication styles. So if you, are, you have been abroad or at least worked a lot with international teams, that's, that's absolutely necessary to, to, build, to build such a team. Because it also makes your work better and Absolutely. easier, I guess, yeah. right? And also more creative, because at the end, if you design something out of Stuttgart or Munich for the rest of the world, it's probably not the right thing to do. Sure, sure. Roger, in general, the view of things is changing, just like the technology of the content itself. Mm. So what will distinguish Male technologies in the future from the previous ones? I would say we started basically our talk about that. I think in the past it was all about, uh, a lot about components. Uh, then we started entering into, at least on the coolant side, in some kind of modular concept, module concepts. Of course, we are now entering much, much more in these highly integrated systems. And of course, what we will see is that in the future, we will even do this system integration on a, and bring it on a le next level. So this means you will then see modules which basically have everything included. So you can then buy a device which is basically your cooling unit and you can take the cooling unit and install it directly in the car. So it's no more about, okay, you have to, to place this component here, this component there. It's, it's about uh, combining what we already know on the system level into smart, intelligent systems, and then, of course, also offer the overall control of it. And that's, uh, of course, a huge change for us. So I guess for our talk now, just one aspect is missing. Jumana, you're constantly concerned with the future. So far, you have a knowledge advantage over all of us. So what will mobility look like in 10 years from now? Hmm. If I knew that, um, <laughs> I would be a highly recommended expert. No, actually, I think there is a lot of change running and, and uh, we're in the middle of transformation. Um, and it's not only about technological transformation, it's about behavior and then also external influencing factors like, for example, the pandemic. So it's, you have to consider a lot of things to think about the future. What we definitely can say is that we will have a significantly higher share of, of electric vehicles in 10 years from now. So we're talking about at least 50% uh, of somehow electrified vehicles. Um, that is going to change definitely. So also the infrastructure will change because if you have so many um, vehicles which require energy, you also have to have the parking facilities, the, the charging facilities. So that's one thing. 
Um, the other thing is, and, and we have been discussing that uh, for the last years, um, automated driving will definitely come. How fast, we will see. But that will also m have an impact on our business because then we're talking about a complete different compartment in the vehicle. Um, and then it's kind of a third living space question and a well-being question. So how do you how do you want to have your inside of the vehicle and how are you driving? Do you use your own car or do we, will we see more shared um, vehicles? That will also be a relevant thing. So it's, we're in the middle of transformation. You cannot say what's going to happen, but it is changing at a very rapid speed, like, like Roger said before, and we have to be fast to adopt to that. So it's not those typical engineering cycles we used to have. We have to be very fast and also talk to the consumers what they want to have and what they require. So sure, you need to adapt and you can not know what's going to happen, but what would you desire? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would desire a lot of things, but the mm. most important thing for me is that that we lead as an industry a very fact-oriented discussion, that we're not driven by opinions or single opinions or feelings. Um, we have to put the facts on the table and then take a deliberate dis decision altogether which direction to go or which way forward, and that would be our biggest wish. So then I can say thank you very thank much, you. Jumana Alcibay and Dr. Roger Bush for our Male Mobility Talk today with the topic Future Mobility and Technology. It was a pleasure to talk to you guys. We are back tomorrow, so I just can say stay tuned and turn in. See you. Bye. <laughs>